see if I can, I can make it. I ran my first 5K yesterday without any training, and that was not a good idea. <laughs> my legs are, boy, those steps, that was 100 steps getting up here. Tell you what, I have to holler for a chair to be brought up if I can't keep the legs blocked. We're continuing today in our study in Joshua. I want to open our time together today with a story. Thomas Dorsey was a black jazz musician from Atlanta, uh, known in the early 1920s for suggestive lyrics that he combined with original music. Then God touched his life, and in 1926, he gave up the suggestive music and began to write spiritual music. 1932 times were hard for Dorsey, as they were for nearly everyone trying to survive the Depression. Because of his past music style, some said his music was too worldly. A lot of harsh criticism for trying to write Christian music with his past. The most difficult night of his life came one night in St. Louis when he received a telegram telling him that his pregnant wife had suddenly died. Dorsey was filled with grief and his faith was shaken. But instead of keeping himself in the pit of loss and depression, he expressed his agony the only way he knew how. He wrote a song. Maybe you've heard it. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn through the storms, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows dear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, least I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. In spite of Dorsey's past, he experienced God's presence during that crisis and that song he wrote to help understand and go through his own crisis has helped through the pain and grief and comforted at many thousands of people since. How many have been comforted by that song? Now, that song came out of pain and grief. It has brought comfort to us. We've all experienced and had those moments where we've experienced pain and grief. Let's be honest about something else as well. We don't deserve God's faithfulness. Because if we're honest, all of us have to admit that there's times we haven't been faithful to Him. And I'm not going to ask your hand to raise your hand and show me if you have not been faithful to Him at any point in your life. Because I know you have. I have. We all have. But God is in the business of giving second chances. And that's what we're going to look at this morning as we continue in our study of Joshua. We're going to look at how God's going to set up a system to give second chances. We're going to have a little bit of history <clears throat> first, and then uh, we're going to tie that together and what it means for us today. So today we're in Joshua, the 20th chapter. So I'm in Joshua 20, and I'm going to read the first five verses for us. Uh, and again, it's not up on the screens. It's going to be in your Bible or on your app. If you want to go through on that. So it says in chapter 20 of Joshua, Then the Lord said to Joshua, so God's talking, Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge, as I instruct you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When he flees to one of these cities, he is to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state his case before the elders of that city. Then they are to admit him into the city and give him a place to live with them. If the avenger of blood pursues him, they must not surrender the one accused. 
because he killed his neighbor unintentionally and without malice aforethought. He is to stay in that city until he has stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the, or until the death of the high priest who is serving at that time. Then he may go back to his own home in the town from which he fled. Went further than five. So the nation of Israel at this time had an army. We know that. They've come into the promised land and been taking over places. But they didn't have anything equivalent to our modern police force. When someone was murdered, the members of the family saw to it that the murderer was brought to justice and received his punishment. Uh, And we can imagine what that was. We need to remember that the Israelites were just becoming a nation. There was no well-established legal code, no system of lawyers and judges, no elaborate rules for dealing with every possibility that would come up. They did have the first five books of the Bible with them and all the laws that are found in them. However, they were just learning how to put them into practice. Remember, this is the birth of a nation we're witnessing here. Uh, And one of the principles dealt with was what happened if someone maliciously killed someone else. The law dealt with that, uh, what happened in the event of a murder. And we're familiar with this. The law was called Lex Talionis, the law of retribution. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Where that came from. You murdered someone, you were killed. And the family was responsible for taking care of that. The penalty for murder was death. And it was the right of the family or someone close to the one that was murdered to avenge that death. It wasn't done by the legal system the way our country does it today. It was all carried out by the victim's family. Avenger comes from the Hebrew word gaal, which literally means next of kin, that avenger of blood. So that's what they had for someone who was murdered. But the point we want to focus on this morning's passage is what was done if the victim wasn't murdered but the death was merely the result of negligence or just an accident. Prior to the giving of the law, there were no provisions for situations like this. Could the family of a fallen person still do whatever they wanted to the person who accidentally had taken the life of a loved one? The answer is no. The law introduced a new principle into the mix that was revolutionary for the time. These cities of refuge were based on the principle that our law is based on today, You were innocent until proven guilty. And this was a new idea, a new concept. Before this, too often people would dish out punishment and then get around to asking questions later. It was not a good system and the rules were going to give as a way to change the status quo in preventing the death of an innocent person. Having said that, boy, That's yeah, a side effect of making a mistake and running yesterday. Having said that, there was still a dead person, even if it was accidental, and there needed to be a penalty. Should the person involved in the death just be allowed to walk away and be free? I mean, we're talking about what today we'd consider manslaughter. Um, and how would mercy relate to this situation? That's the second point. And I think I read ahead and read it. Verse 6 said, He said to stay in the city until they'd stood trial before the assembly or until the death of the high priest serving at the time and then they can go out. So I want you to think through what would happen when an accidental death took place in these days. When an accidental death took place, the person would have rushed to the gate of a city of refuge because until they arrived at the gate of the city of refuge, until they got in the city of refuge, They were fair game. If family members caught up with them, they could be put to death. Once they got to the city of refuge, the leaders would form a court where they would examine the circumstances of the surrounding tragedy that had to determine if the victim's death was accidental or intentional. The death was determined to be malicious. The person was turned over to the victim's family and put to death. On the other hand, if it was unintentional, 
then the person would be permitted to live in the city of refuge. The only problem was, from that day forward, they could never leave the safety of the city. Because if they were ever caught outside the city of refuge, then again, they were fair game for the family. It tells us that even when sin isn't intentional, there are still always consequences. We talked a little bit about that last week. And this may sound pretty harsh, but it actually represented a huge step forward in the legal process. Up to this time, if you were involved, even accidentally, in a person's death, you were going to be killed. And now things have changed. Remaining in the city of refuge guaranteed another chance in life. The person in question here had made mistakes, but thanks to these city of refuges that God created, they had another chance in life. Sometimes what appears to be totally unfair really isn't. Because mercy is significant. I'm continuing 7-9. through nine. <clears throat> so, they are, so they set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kirith Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. On the east side of Jordan of Jericho, they designated Bezer in the desert, on the plateau in the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilgal, in the tribe of Gad, and <clears throat> Golan in Bashan, in the tribe of Manasseh. Any of the Israelites or alien living among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to one of these designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. According to Jewish tradition, the roads leading to these cities had to be kept in excellent condition. Crossroads had to be well marked. They even at times put runners out to help guide people into the city of refuge. As it says in there, Joshua set up three cities of refuge on each side of the Jordan. One on the west side in Kadesh in the north, Shechem in the middle, Hebron in the south, on the east side of the Jordan, Golan in the north, the middle was Ramoth, and Bezer in the south. And if you understand that the Holy Land is about the size of Maryland, with these cities of refuge set out, there weren't very far from one. It was easy to access. And, and what we have to understand is God didn't ignore the fact that justice had to be carried out. Remember, if a person who came to the city of refuge had murdered the victim, they were still put to death. They were still turned over to the family. However, if the person was guilty of manslaughter, they still had a chance. There was something even larger going on here that if we're not careful, we're going to miss. I think it's too important to miss. God's intention was that while there must be justice, His people should be willing to demonstrate mercy as well. Interesting preaching this, looking at the judge sitting there. Who understands this? There are times for justice that needs to be carried out and time for mercy. You know, I mentioned that I wanted to cover two things this morning. I wanted to cover a little bit of historical fact. As we're studying Joshua. That's what is going on in this section of Joshua. God had set up these to help create some laws for His people to be able to live in society together just as we have today. This is kind of laying the foundation for what I really want us to talk about today. And I want to issue a strong challenge to the church. We no longer today have cities of refuge. But my dream would be that the church would take over that role. Okay, now I don't mean that we're going to replace Murray and let people out of jail that have committed manslaughter so they can come and live here at the church. But I am saying that we need to reach out to people that are struggling with Christ's message of mercy to them. There are far too many people out there convinced that Christians look down on everyone who isn't just like them. They assume we're the people that have it all together. The good people. 
and they are not, and not welcome here. And I know, I know, you sit there and you're thinking, that's not true. We know we're not good people. We, we don't look down on people out there. We don't not want them in here. It doesn't matter what we think. We have to understand that's the impression that is had out there. I've shared with you before, I had a couple stop during the week at my church, come into the office, and ask permission to be able to attend the church. Because the church looked too fancy for them because they were poor living out of their car and didn't think they would be welcome in a fancy place like that. That's what's out there. Whether we want to agree with it or not doesn't matter. That's what is believed. People think we got it all together. How do we go about changing that perception? Because the reality is sometimes the perceptions are closer to the truth than we want to admit. I had a dear friend of mine make the statement, the church was never meant to be a showcase for saints. God intended the church to be a hospital for sinners. This is where the people are supposed to come that are messed up in life. That have issues and problems. That have made mistakes. They're welcome. Shown love. You know, especially in the day we live in today, our church needs to be a place where we care about people. People who believe they've failed in life, and we're the ones that come alongside to remind them that God gives second chances, third chances, and fourth chances, and fifth chances. Right? Because all people matter to God. That means sometimes we are likely to be challenged to the point where we're a little uncomfortable. Because the church is to be a modern city of refuge. Probably nearly everyone here this morning might agree with all that. But it's a little more challenging than you think. We have to be willing to reach out to people who are struggling with failure and confusion in their lives. We have to be willing to get out of our doors. And let me tell you, I almost don't think I've ever been more proud of a church than I was last Sunday with our fall festival. And I mean, I have bragged about this church all last week for how many members showed up. We had... 20-something, 25 or 27 trunks for our trunk or treat. We had an amazing turnout for community, and I know many of you have told me that community members were saying all the time, thank you for doing this for the community. How many heard that? I mean, out there at the trunk or treat. Look around if you weren't out of the trunk or treat. It's a difference. They appreciated, the community appreciated us getting out of our building and being welcoming to them. What did Glenda say? How many people were shocked? How much for a hot dog? No charge. What? How much for a soda? No charge. What? Nobody does that. So I, I, I want to applaud the congregation. I, I, I honestly. That was amazing. And, and Betty Webster and I had a conversation and she said, we've got to do this more often. We've got to get out of the building and get out in our community more often. We've got to show our community we care about them. We're not held up in an ivory tower. Making them think we are the people that have it all together. And oh, if they want to come grace our door, great. We've got to get out and show them that we care about them. And you know what? One thing I can guarantee you is going to happen if we start doing that, and that Gonna, it's going to get messy. It's going to get messy. It is. Because if we stay held up here inside the building, we can keep things pretty clean. We can keep things pretty much the way we want them. We can have everything happen as we like it. If we get out of the church and we get involved in the community, it's going to get messy. When you go about sharing Christ's love with the world, it gets messy. And you have to be ready for that got to be ready for the mess. Let me tell you, there are people out there that have really messed up in life. 
They know it. They've made mistakes. They've had struggles. But here's a place where they can find a redemption. Here's a place where God will give them a second chance. Here's a place where they can find love and acceptance if they want to turn their life around and find hope. I'm going to ask some questions to you. Please, please, do not answer yes if you don't mean it. I don't. God knows. You don't have to nod your head. For me and my benefit, God knows where your heart is. Can the divorced mother bring her children here without feeling we're going to judge either her or them? What about the young man who's struggling with addiction? Do we let him know that we love him regardless of what he's dealing with? What about the rebellious teen who dresses to shock? Will they only get our stares? And the person who isn't sure God exists asks questions without being in a how dare you attitude. How about the man covered in tattoos who admits he's been in prison and is struggling to find his way? What if two women came who say they live together in a relationship with each other? Are they welcome to worship here? City of refuge means we reach out to people who are sinners. And we love them who they are. Doesn't mean we help them to stay there. All of us are on the path to be who God has created us to be. All of us are sinners. Right? Who has sinned? Who does Scripture say has sinned? All have sinned. But I wonder sometimes if all sinners are welcome in our churches. Or only the ones who sin like us. Jesus loved sinful people. He did. You can't read the Gospels without understanding that. He was the one that went to the outcasts of society. He went to the ones that society would look at and say, we don't want you around. You are not welcome around us. And I fear far too often the church has taken that same mentality as the society did then. But Christ didn't stand for that. He went and ate with the prostitutes. He ate, went and ate with the tax collectors. He went and ate with the people that society had rejected them to tell them that God loved them. And there was hope for them. You know, I've said before, we all need to be telling people about Christ, and you can't give me the answer, well, everybody I know already is Christian and knows Christ, well then you need to get around some other kind of people. Jesus didn't come for the well. Jesus came for the sick. You know, if we want to reach those who struggle... It probably begins with us being genuine and honest about the fact that we are not perfect ourselves. And I know there's none of you that are going to say, if I ask, are you perfect? Oh yes, I'm perfect. We know that. But we lead ourselves into believing that we're pretty close. We're pretty good. We haven't done any really bad thing. But we're all sinners. We want to reach those who struggle. We need to be honest. We need God's help. God gives second chances to everyone. Thanks be to God. Because if we didn't get second chances, where would we be? How much more are there people in our community that are hurting and lost, that are desperate for a second or a third chance? This is where they need to come. But we can't just expect them to wander in the doors. We've got to get out and show them we can. We need more events like last Sunday. And we can't leave it on membership to say, you've got to come up with one every month out there to do it. It requires all of us. You know, we have, we have these different ministry teams, and they're great, but that doesn't 
take the, uh, that doesn't take the responsibility away from you. You've got an idea to say, hey, it would be great for us to do our community, then stand up. Membership's going to say, go for it. How can we bless you and help you? We, we don't just push that all on one team or another team. It requires all of us working together. And we saw that Sunday. We saw all of us coming together. When we do that, incredible things will happen. You don't have to wait to be asked either. You can see anybody and say, hey, I know Chris would be happy to have you come and say, hey, I've got something I want to do for this church. And this team. Let's go. Let's get it done. I hope that we can be a place of refuge for all people. Helping share the love of God and the mercy of Jesus Christ with our brothers and sisters in our community and around the world. Lord God, we thank You for Your Word today. And while we have a very detailed legal system today, we still have a need for places of refuge. A place where broken people can come and receive mercy, receive grace, receive a love they may have never felt before from You and from Your children. Those who confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Guide and direct us. Share the love of Jesus Christ with all those around us. In Christ's name.